أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله أجرنا وأجركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام So the Prophet is in Medina and later on as the Quran declares he has sent his messenger with a deen in order for it to prevail over all deen. Now the immediate meaning of this that we can understand is by the end of the verse وَلَوْ كَرِيهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ or وَلَوْ كَرِيهَ الْكَافِرُونَ The prevalence of the deen of the Blessed Prophet over all deen does not mean the conversion of the entire region to Islam. Now this is important for us to bear in mind. It is singling out the kafirun and the mushrikun. The prevalence of the deen meant that Islam as a religion would prevail over the region. There would be no more space for kufr and for shirk and their value systems because it was their value system that ruled over the region. It does not mean conversion to Islam of all the other faiths that were not upholding the values of shirk and kufr. And we can see that evidently from Surah Baqarah all the way to Surah Ma'idah. Sequentially, as these verses were being revealed, that the Prophet was accommodating the Jewish, Christian, Sabian community. Later on, the Zoroastrians were accommodated. And then we find that the attitude that he created within the minds of the Muslims was later on that when the Arabs came into trade contact with the Hindus, they accommodated the Hindus as well. And then at Muslim conquests, when the Muslims spread far and wide, they were beginning to give a sort of status of Abrahamic faith to the Buddhists and to people of other faiths that did not strictly belong within the Abrahamic faith. But in one way or another, they were trying to give them and accommodate them. So the verse of the Quran was to finish off the status quo to replace it with Islam and Islam embraces all religion, all religion that subscribe to the same values and, that, and who are monotheistic. And that is why in Surah Toba, towards the end, and, and this is a prelude for today's talk, in Surah Toba, you find the Muslims being exhorted to fight with other empires or other countries that are belonging to the people of the book yet the Quran makes it very clear that they do not believe in God or the hereafter or abide by the righteous religion as opposed to the earlier Christians of Medina and the regions around Medina and the Jews the Jewish people so the deen of Islam does not mean conversion to Islam it means the broad tenets of Islam at a state level would be operating. The sense of justice, the sense of worshipping one God, the sense of doing righteous deeds. And if a group did not belong to that, then that group did not have any space within the new state and the new religion. Otherwise, all the other religions were subsumed and by, were accommodated. I discussed this in book four that it was a very broad system that the Prophet created based on monotheism and righteousness within the soul and justice as a societal principle to accord rights to others. 
Now, the Prophet only has 10 years in Medina. Whether the Prophet knows this or not, but the plan of God as we see now in hindsight was to unfold in 10 years. Now for him to establish the religion of Islam and to create a state and a broader state within 10 years is next to an impossible task. You go around preaching, it takes forever, doesn't it? I remember I was at Hajj, and I can't remember the year now, 2012 or something, and I was wearing sandals as opposed to the flip-flops in Mina. So the Molanas and the uh, devout Kojas, they descended upon me. And they said, how dare you wear sandals? I said, it's my feet and they're hurting me. And they said, well, you're not allowed to. I said, according to my own ijtihad, I used to do it at that time as well. It's perfectly allowed. So they were enraged. After seven years, they changed the fatwa and they were allowed to wear sandals. Now, if it takes seven years to go from flip-flop to sandals, now imagine how long it takes for people to organically evolve into a new message and shift the whole paradigm. It would have taken the Prophet two or three hundred years to convert the whole region. So what do you do? What you do is you pick a fight with the boss. That is something quite intriguing. I was in the... Now this is going back before most of you people took birth and before recorded history began. When I was 16. I'm glad you're listening. So I was in a sixth form college. And there was a, bo there was a man there. Was a, he was the boss. The real Don. He was a Pathan. And his name was Jahangir. And we, I was in the common room. And they were all, you know, smoking away their joints and everything. It was quite a pleasant sort of an atmosphere. Because you always felt happy around them. In any case, he is the Don. Now he sits there with all his gangs and the followers and they had the might. I used to pray namaz at that time. I used to say, I want my prayer met and I will pray and whatever. So they respected me to an extent. But at the same time as well, there was fear in my heart as to what these guys could do to me. So now once Jangir called me, he said, Arif, I said, what? He said, come here. So I was thinking, right, if I don't go there, I'm going to get it. And if I do go there, then it means I'm surrendered to him. Now, what happened was that I tripped. And he was sitting there. And I was fall as I was falling on him, I thought, I'm dead anyway. Let me take a punch at him. So I punched him and then punched him again. And he was caught by surprise. Then his followers, they, well, the, the kids there, they separated me. By the time he got up, he was full of admiration. He shook my hand. He said, you're the only person here who has the guts to do this. Now, I know he could have flattened me and he could have killed me, but it, it won me the appreciation of all of them at that point. What do you do? You become strategical. The prophet cannot spread his message within a span of 10 years. It's an impossible task. Now, look at the context of the blessed prophet and his genius. And at the same time, he was so sincere, being led by the day. He has matured and deepened in his own self. He is no longer now merely receiving revelation from Jibrail or from God that he calls Quran. He is being inspired. He has dreams. He has intuition. All of these things are within him. He is now sure of his own self. It's no longer the case that was in Makkah, Yasin, Wal Quran, Al Hakim, Inna ka la min al Mursaleen. Don't doubt, although the Quran doesn't say don't doubt, but the stress, Inna ka. Indeed, you are amongst the messengers or amongst the prophets. That is no longer the case. He knows he is the messenger. Even when uh, or Khalifa Umar objects to the uh, treaties of Hudaybiyah, he says to Umar, indeed, I am a prophet and I know what I'm doing. And then, of course, the justification comes in Surah Fat subsequent to that. But he had taken the decision without the formal revelation. So the prophet's being has deepened. He can take decisions. He uses his own discretion. Now here is Medina. On the one hand, he is a guest of the people of Medina. On the other hand, he is their head. He has a community with him. They do not have any means of financial support. 
the first thing the Prophet did was he made brotherhood between the people of Makkah and Medina. So the people of Makkah were living off the people of Medina. And you do know that that cannot continue. That is something that will not continue. Now later on, you find an evidence for this. When the Prophet went to battle with Bani Mustaliq, Abdullah bin Ubay, who was a character known for his defiance and rejection of the Prophet, and I'll talk about it in him about in a little while, he said to his group of people who are influential and quite large, and this is recorded in Surah uh, Munafiqun, لا تنفقوا على من عند رسول الله حتى ينفضوا. Do not spend your wealth upon the people who are with the messenger of God until they go back and go away. Because their thing was that, look, we are keeping these people. If we stop giving them wealth and money, they will be forced out of Medina. So you know when you go as a guest to a city, you cannot remain a guest. You have to earn for your own self. In fact, you have to contribute to the city. So that was a problem. On the other hand, you had the massive Jewish clans and tribes, especially three of them that were very, very big. The Banu Qaynaka, Banu Nadir or Nudair, and Banu Qurayda. These people were also very suspicious of the Prophet, but they had a treaty with the Prophet that they will not be treacherous. They would not default on their treaty by siding with the enemy or by attacking the Muslims. So there was a threat, one, from the Jewish people. Two, the Medinian Muslims that had embraced Islam, which was majority of them, did not really understand the Islam of the Prophet and they were very suspicious of what is going on. Yes, they were led into Islam like most of us are, but then afterwards we think, I don't really understand this new religion. So they were suspicious, they weren't understanding. And then there was a huge group of Muslims like Abdullah bin Ubay, who was destined to be the head of Khazraj and possibly the head of Aws and Khazraj who were fighting amongst themselves. And when the Prophet came into Medina, they all embraced Islam. So obviously he was disgruntled, he did not like the Prophet, he accepted Islam because it was convenient for him. He also had a hundred people with him that were following him. Now these were called the Munafiqeen afterwards by the Quran. Now you can imagine how strong this group was that when the Prophet went for his second battle in Ohad, he had a thousand people. The Meccans were three thousand. I'll take you through the chronology in just a little while. The Meccans were three thousand. The Prophet had thousand. This man with his hundred, with, with 300 followers, they left the battlefield. That's a sizable community. Now you, you will definitely ponder that if there are 300 men that are leaving the Prophet, then they also have families and children. So you can imagine the amount of numbers of the people of Medina who were not only skeptical of, of the Prophet, but who were opposed to the Prophet internally. And their whole understanding was that this Prophet is bringing trouble upon us. We did not ask for all these battles and for all this war and all this chaos. And we were living on friendly terms with the Quraysh. Why do we need this? And it's a real life story. This is how things happen. When somebody comes to you and gathers a band of people and then invites wars in your own house and fights, that's not something very comfortable. So it's a very real story that is taking place. So on the one hand, you have the Jewish clan. On the other hand, you have the Munafiqeen. Then you have the Medinian people who are not really understanding what's really going on. Then you have the big shot, the Quraysh. And in the midst of all of that, you want to spread your religion. Now that is the context. If you read the Quran chronologically, and of course the battles of the prophets and the raids are something that we really do need to understand in order to get a proper appreciation of the metal of this man, how he grew into the revelation, how he began to take uh, decisions, the strategy that, it, that he had, and at times when things would go wrong, how they would be tweaked to put right again, and the trajectory was set on course once again for his success. So now, did the Prophet know that he would spread the religion within 10 years? 
he did not have any assurance any he had given he had been given zero assurance as we've been citing the verses of the quran i don't know what will be done to me or to you oh muhammad we may show you some of what we have promised to do to them or we may just kill you before that now the prophet did not know whether this verse meant at the end of his missionary journey or it was an immediate meaning so he was left on knife's edge and we will see this throughout because it was such a true real human story that is why it's yielded so much success but the way things are unfolding and the way things are falling in place is amazing so now the only way for the prophet now to secure himself economically is to raid the Qureshi caravans. Now you ask, why would a prophet want to raid caravans, trade caravans? The justification here that the historians present, and of course uh, Karen Armstrong also presents this justification, that it was the norm back in the day that you raid caravans and it economically enriches you. <clears throat> and that's why caravans would take different routes and need protections. But I don't think that that was the case, as you will see in a little while. In the case of the Prophet and the caravan, it was a case of justification. There was a justification there, which we will read in a little while, that the Prophet felt that he was expelled from his home. And that the Muhajirun who left Makkah and came to Medina, their properties were confiscated. Now the Meccans are seeing this very differently. They are saying, well, you dishonored us by defecting and going to the other side. So they were enraged. They just did not like the Muslims. On the other hand, the Muslims are saying, you expelled us. Can you see that? Now this is an argument. You need a diplomat here to bring solution to both sides. Thank God there weren't any diplomats there because it wouldn't have happened otherwise. In fact, when the Prophet might have wanted a diplomatic solution, the Quran was against it. You may have been inclined to them somewhat. And the Quran's tone is stern. There is no way you are going to compromise with them in any form or shape or manner. This religion has to go. Finish. The Quran had decided this religion has to go. So there was a justification here that they have expelled us from our houses. So we are in a state of combat with them. Now, if you remember the Treaty of the Prophet, there you have the common enemy known as the Quraysh, against who everybody will be united and nobody will be their allies. So then the Prophet orders raids on the Qurayshi caravans. But six of them or seven of them, they fail. The eighth raid takes place. The Muslims kill a person, capture two people, and get their properties, the raisins and dates and whatever they were trading in, and they bring it back to Medina. What happened was that this raid and killing happened in the month of Rajab. The month of Rajab is a sacred month. There is no killing in the sacred month. That was the Arab custom and the Jewish custom as well, that you cannot kill anybody in those sacred months. There is no warfare, flatly, finished. So the people who went for the raid they were all the muhajirin none of the ansar had joined them not because they did not want to but the people selected only the meccans to go for these raids now when they came back with the spoils of war the madinan muslims were rebuking the muhajirin for killing a person in the sacred month and waging a fight and capturing two people we when we read history of course and we have to read it broadly the prophet was perturbed well what do i do now what do i do now now although some gave the justification that the prophet said well i asked them to raid but not to kill in the month the sacred month so it might have been the first of rajab and therefore it was just in the sacred month and they should not have done this so you can see that the Prophet may not have intended them to raid the caravan in the sacred month. They nonetheless did it in the sacred month and they killed someone. Now here is a problem, a real existential problem. 
because the Muslims, they feel you should not have done this. We should honor the sacred months. The Jews saw this as a bad omen. And the Quraysh said, Muhammad's religion violates even the sacred month. Now, this was a very difficult time for the Prophet. This is where we see the intervention of the Quran. And there is exceedingly more and more direct form of intervention from this point onwards till the end of the prophetic mission. So this verse comes. يَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ سَنْ سُرَ بَقَرَةً They ask you about the sacred month. قِتَالٌ fi In terms of warfare within the sacred month. Now look at the language of the Quran. قُلْ قِتَالٌ fihi kabir. Say that warfare is a grave sin in the sacred month. وَالسَّدُّنْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ But yet, blocking people from the path of God and disbelieving in God and blocking people from the Masjid Al-Haram and to expel the people of Masjid Al-Haram from Masjid Al-Haram is far greater than warfare in the sacred month. Can you see this? This was the justification that was given. وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ Discord is far worse than shedding blood in the masjid uh, in the uh, in the month of the sacred month. وَلَا يَزَالُونَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ حَتَّى يَرُدُّونَكُمْ عَنْ دِينِكُمْ إِنْ إِسْتَطَاعُوا And they will not cease to fight you until they cause you to turn away from your religion as long as as, as much as they are able to. So here the Muslims are given justification. Once that justification comes, the Prophet is acquitted of any blame. And those people who have, who mounted the raid, they were acquitted of any blame because now God has sanctioned it. Now obviously, you are seeing the minds of the Jews here saying that, no, this is very convenient, this verse. The Munafiqeen are saying, this was a real chance for us, but it is slipped out of our hands. The naive Muslims are saying, you know what? Look at them. They are a strong group of people. They can raid caravans with impunity in this instance. They can bring back wealth and they can economically bring us stability. So now in the mind of the Meccan Muslims, they are getting assured, but not fully. The Munafiqeen are getting more and more frustrated. The Jews are getting extremely frustrated. Now what we see is that the Medinan people are more than happy to participate in raids. So then the Prophet gets news that Abu Sufyan is advancing from Syria through a route that crosses them with huge amounts of wealth of the Quraysh. Now the historians will say to us, I mean the apologetic ones, that the Prophet must have thought that had he raided that caravan, it would starve the Quraysh into submission and surrender. I'm not very sure if that was the case. I'm not sure if that was the case. Maybe the Prophet just thought it's a convenient thing. We can get their caravan, it can secure us economically. So in this instance, the Muhajireen were about 80 and about, uh, I'm not a good Koja as far as calculation is concerned, so there were 313 to 315 people, out of which 80, 8, 88 or 83 were Muhajireen. The rest of them were Ansar. Two-thirds were Ansar, one-third were Muhajireen. Over two, uh, yeah, two-thirds, over two-thirds were Ansar, one-third were Muhajireen. They went in pursuit of that caravan. I don't want to under, uh, deal with the battle here. I want to deal with something else. They were in pursuit of the caravan. Now here you can see that how things are being planned beyond the Prophet's strategy, strategy of the Prophet. They're going towards the caravan. Abu Sufyan gets news. So he hurries to Mecca to get a force. Abu Jahal and they gather a force of a thousand people to advance towards the Muslims in order to finish them off. Abu Sufyan cleverly steers the caravan through a different direction and the danger is averted like the previous raids. All of them had failed. So Abu Sufyan sends back the message to the Meccans, we don't need to engage with these people. Abu Jahl said, no, 
He was very articulate as well, Abu Jahl, and one of the known people of Mecca. He said, no, we will kill them and we will celebrate. Now, if you look at it differently, you will say that the Muslims did not know what they were going for. They really did not know that they will end up in a full-fledged battle. The Muslims only thought 300 of them are going to go and raid a caravan and bring the goods back. They were pursuing the caravan. The Meccans thought, well, they are 313. Why not just engage with them and finish them off? This is what I call intervention of the divine. Something else was happening here. They did not know that the plan was being made at a different level. There were interdimensional connections and play. Now, in our lives, we are very mindless of the things that are happening above us that bring incidences together. It's only in hindsight when we look and we say, actually, you know what, that was the best thing that ever happened. And I really don't know. It was a sheer coincidence that that happened. But it was the best outcome. It shaped the rest of my life. Right? This is something, do you want me to give you an, ex an example? No? Okay. So things were coming together. Now, the Muslims advanced towards in the direction of Badr. And the Meccans were coming to Badr. Now the Prophet was primed as to what is going to happen. The Muslims were largely on foot. They did not have weaponry. The Meccans had hundreds of horses, camels, and fully mailed, or a lot of them, and they had their archers and swords and spears and whatever else they had. I want to recite certain verses here. These, the incident of Badr comes in Surah Anfal, and again in Surah Ali Imran, in two places. The justification for this particular battle is, this is because they acted adversely to Allah and His Messenger. And whoever acts adversely to Allah and His Messenger, then surely Allah is severe in requiting evil. But these verses are revealed subsequent to the decision that the Prophet, the Prophet took on that day. Now, it seems that the Prophet already had a premonition and God talks of this premonition. And when Allah promised you one of the two parties that it shall be yours, and you loved that the one not armed should be yours, and Allah desired to manifest the truth of what was true by his word and to cut off the roots of the unbelievers. So the prophet was under the impression that he will either get the caravan or he will meet them at Badr. And the prophet desired that he gets the unarmed one, the one at the caravan, Abu Sufyan's caravan. Yet the verse is saying to the Prophet, but God wanted to decisively prove a point and to cut off the disbelievers through this battle. But now you see that the Muslims are outnumbered, 313 or 15, and the others are about 1,800 to 1,000. What happened subsequently to that? When Allah showed them to you in your dream as few. So the Prophet was receiving communication in his dreams. And he was trusting those dreams. But those dreams were not termed as Quran. And if he had shown them to you as many as you, then you would have certainly become weak hearted. And you would have disputed about the matter. But Allah saved you. Surely he is the knower of what is in the chests. So the Prophet himself is being told that Allah showed them to you few in numbers. When you looked on in the battle of Badr, they appeared few to you. Now imagine if you're only 313 people and you see thousand people fully armed on horses and camels, that in itself would cause a lot of terror and fear. There are several things that are happening here. And then on the other hand, what is happening is, and when the shaitan made their works fair seeming to them and said, no one can overcome you this day and surely I'm your protector. On the other hand, the shaitan was inspiring their heart that you will have decisive victory on this day. 
So Abu Jahl was being motivated by this anger and rage that we will finish them off and we will kill them. On the other hand, the Muslims were shown those people as a small group. Allah says, and he made you appear to them as very small as well. But look at the other thing that the verse says, and I'm, I'm, I'm selective here. And when you sought aid from your Lord, so he answered you, I will assist you with a thousand of angels following one another. And when your Lord revealed to the angels, I am with you, therefore make firm those who believe. I will cast into their hearts, into the hearts of those who disbelieve. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. It's amazing the sort of things that are happening at Badr and the sort of intervention that is taking place. So the Meccans are somehow being inspired that kill these Muslims. They are offensive bunch of people. They are very few. On the other hand, the Muslims are being told that you're being assisted by God and by angels. Now on that note, I just want to ask a question here and then we will think about it for the next few years and then we will come to it if Allah gives life. When Allah said, وَلَقَدْ رَعَاهُ فِي الْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ The Prophet saw him in the, in, in the horizon and the sky. One Jibrail filled the whole of the skies and horizon. God is sending thousand angels. Can you see that? Thousand angels. The Muslims are 300 something. The Kuffar are 800 to 1000. Are the angels so weak that you need thousand angels? Think about this. And then Surah Ali Imran says, and then I will assist you with 300 more, uh, 3,000 more angels. So you see, here it is, when we read the Quran, we begin to understand that we have not understood things accurately. There is something else going on. There's an interplay of different dimensions. Angels is not a simple word. There are many different things happening. <clears throat> In any case, now, in Badr, when three opponents are called, Imam Ali, Hazrat Hamza, and a cousin of the Prophet come and defeat their opponents. And two of them are related to Hind, or three, or all three of them are related to Hind. Then at that point, the Prophet said to the Muslims, whoever amongst you falls into their ranks without a male will go straight into paradise. The Muslims threw whatever they were eating, and they went and they charged at the Meccans. It was a decisive victory for the Muslims because the Meccans were seeing them few in numbers, yet they were finding they're coming from everywhere. And they had this strength. So the angels, the strength of the angel was not this sort of mystical beings coming and chopping heads off. The strength of the angels was working through the physical bodies of the Muslims. You know, all these stories that Abu Sufyan said, we saw riders on horses coming from the sky. If anybody were to see that, they would run away straight away, wouldn't they? They didn't see any riders coming from the sky. They would have run away. They didn't see any such thing. These are the stories we make up. The evidence for that is that the Quran says that if there are 20 of you, you will over 200 of you, you will overcome 2,000 of them. Now Allah knows there are weak amongst you. So 1,000 of you will overcome 2,000. Like that, that's the ratio. I can't remember the numbers exactly. It just shows that the strength of faith was assisting, Allah was assisting them through their strength of faith. Now, when the Muslims died and they killed a great many of the people of Makkah, I just want to read a few more things that, 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 that is happening here, uh, and my time is finishing very, very rapidly. I want us to get an understanding of what is happening. There are a few things here to note. <clears throat> the people around the area, they are saying this is a force to be reckoned with. They took on a thousand people. They did not care less for their life. Look at their strength, look at their resolve. They are rich, they are prosperous, they are united, they are disciplined, they are the emerging power. Imagine how it would impact the onlooker. They are all little tribes at war with each other. And of course, they subsequently united against the Blessed Prophet. But the impression that it created in their minds. Then, the verses came down. 
It is amazing. These are in Ali Imran in response to the people who run away in Battle of Uhud. لا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا Do not reckon those slain in the way of Allah as dead. بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون They are alive. They are being sustained by their Lord. فرحين بما أتاهم الله من فضله They are delighted with what Allah has given them from His grace. وَيَسْتَفْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And they are giving good tidings to those who have not yet joined them. أَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There is no fear upon them and they will not grieve. يَسْتَفْشِرُونَ بِنِعْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ They are giving glad tidings of the blessings of Allah. وَفَضْلٍ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ عَجْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And they are giving the tidings of great uh, grace from God and Allah will not go, uh, bring to waste the actions of the believers. Now, you read verses like this to somebody, to young people, what will it do to them? It will spur them even more. That freshness of faith. This is what we need. We are on the right path. And people, youth, like fighting. They've got that much aggression in them. And these are Arabs, meat-eating people. I mean, we all eat meat, but these guys are real meat. I forget all of that. 50 to 70 Meccans are killed. 70 are captured. 14 Muslims are killed. Now look at the strategy of the Blessed Prophet. He says, what do we do with these captives? Of course, the people of Makkah, they ran away. They left all their goods behind. So the Muslims bought them and the people of Medina were overjoyed. That Look at them. They're getting the spoils of war. We need to join them next time round. Indeed, there is a God. Indeed, he is the messenger. Indeed, his discretions are accurate. So they were all getting empowered. Munafikin were getting frustrated. The Jews were getting even more frustrated. In any case, he said, what do we do with these captives? So he was given the advice, let them pay ransom and free themselves. So the ransoms were levied in accordance with their statuses. They paid their ransoms and they left. However, other things were also happening. Walid bin Walid, the brother of Khalid bin Walid, his ransom was paid by Khalid bin Walid. But for the time in which he stayed with the Prophet, the conduct of the Prophet and his community impacted him to such an extent that he went back to Mecca, then came back as a Muslim. They asked him, why didn't you just stay in Medina? He said, least anybody thinks that my conversion was a convenient conversion. I wanted to prove that it's a genuine conversion. Then the Prophet's son-in-law was captured. He had an adopted daughter by the name of Zainab. Now he didn't, he didn't have any money to free himself from the Prophet, of course, being very sympathetic, adopted daughter of Khadija. So he sent word to somebody in Makkah to send his ransom. Zainab sent her necklace. The Prophet wept. The Prophet said to the Muslims, do you allow me that she is the daughter, adopted daughter of Khadija, to honor the mother of the Believers, of course, they were not given the title of mother of the believers, but to honor the Bibi Khadija and to send this necklace back and send him back. On the proviso that he lets Zainab come to Medina, migrate to Medina because Zainab had converted. He allowed Zainab to come to Medina. Now this man did not convert. At the conquest of um, uh, Makkah, the man converted. The Prophet said to Zainab, go back as his wife. I'm just saying, look at the broadness of the Prophet. He did not say at that time that you cannot be married to a mushrik and your marriage gets null and void and it's broken. No, the Prophet's strategy was extremely different. There were other people from the captives who could not free themselves through ransom. The Prophet said to them, whoever were literate to teach the people of Medina to read and write, and that would be something that gives them their freedom. Now, the problems continued with the Munafikin and the Jewish clans. One by one, the Jewish clans were expelled because of their breaking, breaking their treaties with the Prophet by joining the Quraysh. So Qaynaqa were expelled, the Bani Nadir were expelled because of what they were planning to do uh, to the Prophet by assassinating him. But when the Meccans laid siege, on the Madanian, the Madanian community, Bani Quraidah were helping them. It is here in Surah Ohad that you need to read the verses that explain the situation. 
in Ohad, the Muslims fled, hearing that Muhammad has been killed. But the verse of the Quran is, Ma Muhammad illa Rasul. Muhammad is not but a messenger. Kad khalat min qablihi rusul. Before him have gone many messengers. If he is killed or if he dies, shall you turn back? So here the Quran was telling them that the message that is coming here is not contingent to Muhammad. In your minds, this is Islam. Whether Muhammad lives or dies, it makes little difference. And then these people were told to re-examine their own selves in the verses of Surah Ali Imran, that Allah is yet to know the true believers amongst you and the people who will engage in His way as opposed to those who are not true believers. So at the defeat of Ohad, I'm just going to quickly finish these two parts. The Muslims retreated. Abu Sufyan, he said, we can go forward. Muhammad has not been killed. Go and finish them off. The Muslims were told that they are coming. The Muslims were wounded. The biggest part played here was by Imam Ali. When the Muslims fled and some of them went to Abu Sufyan and they said, we are ready to rejoin your religion. Give us protection. So this was the state of the Muslims. Even the best of them were scared. In any case, the Muslims went and they reflected upon their state when these verses were being revealed. That indeed we have behaved hypocritically. We went for spoils of war. We do not have grounded faith in our hearts. And the Quran was using this as a means to further embed within their souls the real Islam of the Prophet. The, God says to them, if you die, you're going to come back to me anyway. Isn't that better for you? It was just reshaping their minds. So the wounded Muslims came out to meet with Abu Sufyan. This is another intervention that, ex, that happens throughout the prophetic life after this. The first was in Badr. God says in the Quran, I struck terror in their hearts. At this point as well, God says, I struck terror in their hearts. When they saw you, they were frightened. And then they left and then they went away. The third time, what happens is that when they lay siege, on Medina and the trunk, uh, trench is uh, dug, there are thousands of, there, is, there, there are 10,000, 8 to 10,000 of Meccans, different tribes united, of course, and the Jews of uh, Khaybar, who are the people who had been expelled from Medina, the Bani Nadir, they too had gathered about 2,000 people. Now there, the Prophet dug a trench, but the people, the Jewish clan in Medina were beginning to attack. This was the truest test for the Muslims. Read Surah Ahzab and see how God describes their state. The Mu'mineen were tested at that point and they shook a tremendous shaking. Some of them they said, and God points out the Munafikin, that our houses are unprotected. They were merely looking for excuses. In any case, there was a violent storm there. Food had been depleted. They had been blocked there by the trench for a month. The Medinan community was suffering from shortage of food. And so were the Meccans. And there was a violent storm. Of course, the only person that came over was Amr ibn Abdul Wood and Imam Ali put him to death. But when you read these verses, you will see that the Muslims are feeling empowered. Bani Quraidha were then finished off. And the Munafikin are getting more and more frustrated. But in the midst of all of this, what is happening is you find 8,000 to 10,000 people coming. They are finding interventions. They are finding that that meet with frustration. The Muslims are outnumbered, all oh, outnumbered all the time. Yet they cannot do anything to the Muslims. This is creating a phenomenal impression in the minds of those around. And they were becoming sympathetic towards Islam, not necessarily due to God's centricity or its righteousness, but due to that this is the emerging power. And we need to be with this power. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to finish what I wanted to do today. I might continue tomorrow. We come to the great martyr of this night. 
no matter how much mention we make of him, it is not enough. He is the backbone of Imam Hussein, and he is the one who inspires our heart. From the very young age, it's the name of Abbas that moves the hearts and brings tears to the eyes. I'm going to narrate very freely today. I really do believe that Imam Hussein genuinely did hope against hope so long as Abbas was alive. There was a commotion and jubilation at a distance. Shimar asks, who has been killed? Abbas ibn Ali has been put to death. He smiled. Now Hussein shall not escape. This is the first time Hussein says, now my back has been broken. Such is Abbas and his stature. In his descriptions we find, Kal Jabal al He was like a lofty mountain. Wa Kalbahu Katawdil Jaseem. And his heart was like a momentous wave. Kana Farisan Hammaman. He was a champion swordsman, a fearless warrior. He would advance amidst the showering arrows and the striking blades and cut the ranks in two. We are told about the great stature of Abbas, that if he were to ascend his steed, his feet may be touching the surface of the ground. Look at how grand this Abbas was. As Bashir comes into Medina, and says, Ya ahla Yathrab ala muqama lakum biha. O people of Yathrab, there is no place for you in Yathrab. Hussein has been killed. And his son awaits outside the city of Medina. Go and receive him. And pay your condolences to him. An old woman comes and says, O Bashir, this is a lie. It is the truth, O maid of God. How can Hussein be killed? Where was my Abbas? He was killed. But who can face my Abbas? O maid of God, through treachery his arms were severed. And then a maze was struck upon his blessed head, and then he descended upon the earth. He said, O Abbas, had your sword been in your, on you, in your hands, none, should have, none would have approached you. We are told, that when Hazrat Abbas's grave needed to be repaired, Sayyid Bahrul Ulum took a builder or a worker to plaster the grave. The worker said, O oh Master, may I ask you a question? He said, Indeed. He said, You always narrate that Abbas's stature was such that if he would ascend a steed, his feet would touch the earth. He said, yes. Then why is his grave so small? Bahrul Ulum struck his head against the grave and cried out, فَقَطَّعُوهُ irban irba." They cut him into pieces. Look at Abbas. His name's Abu Al-Fadl. Kamar Bani Hashim. Hamilul Liwa. Staqqa. Hami. Fadi. All these beautiful names are his. To get an understanding of this man's bravery in the battle of Sifin, whenever Ali ibn Abi Talib would enter the battlefield, none would approach him. On an occasion, Ali sends his son Abbas, young at that time, with a face covering. He goes into the battlefield, calls for an opponent. Abu Sha'asa comes into the battlefield. Abbas slices him effortlessly. They cry out, it is Ali. Approach him not, he is deceiving you. As there is this commotion in the ranks of the people of Muawiyah, Ali comes into the battlefield behind Abbas. And he places his hand upon the face mask of Abbas. And as he unveils it, he says, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib, wa hadha qamar bani Abbas.
עד הקמר בני האשם. אהי עמלי בני אבי טלב, this is the moon of the Hashemis. such is this gallant warrior of us. Would you want to see his real strength? Think about this. His right arm is cut from his body. And he cries out, Wallah, law qata'atum yameeni. Fa inni abadan uhami an deeni. By Allah, even if you cut off my right arm, I shall not cease to defend my deen and my Imam Hussein. When they cut his left arm, he says, O soul, fear not, for they have severed your left arm. Take the glad tidings of the Rahman instead. Imam Zainul Abidin, we say and we hear that he was burying the bodies. And they said there is a body at the banks of the Al-Qama. He refuses to move. Zainul Abidin says he will not come to me, I shall go to him. We are told that after the massacre, when they were being moved, Zainul Abidin comes to the body of Abbas and he says, Wa Abbasa, after you left, the heavens became illuminated and the earth becomes a darkened place for us. If only you heard the cries of your sisters calling out to you as the whip was unleashed upon their backs. Abbas, on the morning of Ashura, is guarding the tents. A companion of Imam Hussein comes to Abbas and he says, Oh Abbas, do you know why your father sought you? He said, he sought you for this day, O oh Abbas, in a state of rage. Abbas says, do you wish to incite me? He goes into the battlefield, engages in a battle, kills many opponents, and he comes back and he says, do not incite me. The day progresses. The companions have breathed their last. The brothers of Abbas, the family of Hussein, Ali Akbar, they have all tasted martyrdom. They have all received martyrdom. Abbas comes to Hussein and he says, Oh brother, allow me to fight. I cannot withstand your state of loneliness and destitution. Imam Hussein looks deep in the eyes of Abbas and says, Benafsi anta ya Abbas. May my soul be ransomed for you, O Abbas. If you go, the morale of my army shall be devastated. Abbas said, Oh Hussein, what army? There is none but you and I. There is a cry from the tents, Abbas, take news. As if a child has died due to thirst. Abbas comes to a place where the water is being kept and he sees little children rubbing the water skins upon their bellies due to thirst. Abbas says, fear not, little children, I shall bring you back water. He picks up a water skin, comes to Hussein, and he says, Hussein, allow me to bring back some water for them. Hussein looks into the eyes of Abbas, knowing he will not see his brother again. Abbas kisses the forehead of Hussein, looks towards the sky and pleads, O oh God, Allow me to bring back some water for them. Abbas makes his way. Hussein goes with him. They are intercepted by the enemies. Hussein is wounded. Abbas goes ahead and looks back and says, Oh brother, go back, retreat. Abbas removes the blockade, enters into the Alqama, fills the water skin cups some water and brings it towards his mouth. And he says, O oh soul, you have no right to live after Hussein. 
shall you drink of the cold water when Hussein thirsts? He throws away the water and he says, Wallah, ma hada fi aludini. By Allah, Abbas's religion does not allow him such a thing. Abbas exits the Alqama, engages in the battle, makes way towards the tent. From behind the trees, someone severs his right arm. Abbas holds his standard and water in the left arm. As he is going, his left arm is severed. From afar, Hussein sees the falling of his standard. Hussein is confused and perplexed. Arrows are released at Abbas. Some enter into his blessed eye, and another enters into the water skin. When Abbas sees that the water has spilled, he stops his steed. A maze strikes the blessed head of Abbas. He lowers his head. He is surrounded by the enemies. Abbas falls to the ground. Hussein ascends Zuljana. Take me to my brother, O Zuljana. Zuljana stops at a, pl at a place. Have you found my brother? He descends from the horse. He says, Zuljana. Where is my Abbas? And he sees the severed arm of Abbas. He moves on and sees the lion of Hussein about to breathe his last. He takes the head of Abbas into his lap. Abbas moves away his head. Abbas is saying something. Hussein draws near to him and he's saying, Oh man, wait for a while. Allow my brother to come to me first. It is I, Hussein, O Abbas. There is a wound in one eye, and another eye has been shot with an arrow. Imam Hussein takes Abbas's head into his lap, cleanses his face of dust. Abbas's eyes flood with tears. Hussein says, O Abbas, what brings grief to your heart? He says, O brother, how may I not grieve? When I see you lifting my head from the dust and cleansing it from dust, while I know that very soon you will be beheaded on a burning thirst and none shall come and lift your head. Hussein cries out aloud. Hussein tries to pick the body of Abbas. Hussein, what is it that you do? Abbas, allow me to take you back. He says, Hussein, allow me to stay here. I feel embarrassment from your daughter, Sakina. If Zainab sees me in this state, her morale will break. Hussein advances without Abbas, carrying the standard of Abbas. From afar, the children see the standard of Abbas. They run and behind them is Zainab. Sakina calls out, O oh, father. What news do you bring of my uncle Abbas? He is slain at the banks of al Kama, O oh child. Zainab says, O oh brother, why did you not bring my brother back to me? He said, O oh Zainab, he was mindful of you even on his last breath. Matame Hussein.